I want to say hello to everyone who is joining us here tonight. I'm Renee Casterline with Siskiyou Land Trust, and we're delighted to be here tonight with Dr. Michael Pollack. My, Dr. Michael Pollack is with NOAA Fisheries. And for those of you who have sat through our webinar series now for these past two winters, you've seen some of the other presentations about beaver, and that's been by the Scott River Watershed Council. You know, he mentioned Betsy earlier and Sharna, um, the folks there at the Watershed Council doing amazing work in the Scott Valley on the Scott River with Beaver Dam, Beaver Dams, BDAs, and other restoration projects. And I was telling Michael just last week was the um, Scott Watershed Information Forum that Scott River Watershed Council puts on. And it's an amazing event. We spent a day in the field. We got to go look at some of these beaver dams and beaver dam analogs that really that work in the Scott Valley originated with Michael. He was, you know, a big part. He has literally written the book, co-written the book, um, the Beaver Restoration Guidebook, and has spent time, Michael has spent time in the Scott Valley and is, you know, well aware and engaged in the work that's going on there. Um, Michael's work extends beyond the Scott Valley. And tonight we'll hear about more than um, the perspective as it relates to beaver, which we've heard about in other presentations. And we'll get Michael's broader view on beaver and salmon and restoration. So if you have been to those webinars before, this is really a great building block for those things that we've heard about in previous years. So uh, Michael, I don't want to take too much time talking about you. I'd rather let you speak. So um, with that, I want to hand it over to you and you're welcome to get started and then we'll take breaks as you decide to um, speak to questions. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for, for making it super um, wonderful to be here um, virtually and, and so glad so many people are in attendance. Um, I am going to set this up so that I can see the chat. Um, and if you have questions, you can answer them, or I'll try to answer them. You, you, well, you can answer them too, but uh, you can ask them and I will try to do that in a timely manner. And if not, we'll get to them at the end. Um, and um, with that, I think we can go ahead. I did want to just, um, uh, Betsy Stapleton and Sharna Gilmore were given a shout out and I just want to give them another one. They um, have been really instrumental in terms of, of um, beaver and beaver restoration in California and really, um, in my view, some of the pioneers in the use of um, a sort of uh, uh, cutting edge uh, technologies to restore streams and, and to restore habitat. Um, it, it's been really um, just an amazing experience to, to be with them and, and along the way to run into um, one of your board members, uh, Gareth Plank, who's um, just one of my all time favorite people as well. Um, there's nothing that makes me happier than to discuss philosophical issues with Gareth. So, so just want to acknowledge um, uh, him and, and the inspiration he's provided. Um, I, I um, you know, here to talk about beaver, but more generally, um, really about restoration and really that comes to land management and, and stream management. And even more generally, it's about how we live and coexist with other species within this world and how we have a sustainable future. So, um, you know, it's, it's always, beaver are always a good focal point, but really what we're um, thinking about uh, many of us when we think about beaver is, is how do we develop ecosystems that are sustainable that support the things that we value um, and in and, and particular fish but um, even more <laughs> particular than fish or more specific than fish how we retain and keep water on the landscape for whatever uses we might have so um, we're undergoing a fundamental shift right now in terms of how we think about watersheds, how we think about streams. And um, a lot of that is, is due to, to beaver and our understanding of, of them um, and, and what they do uh, uh, to stream systems. So with that um, sort of broad sense, I, I have 
titled this Beaver Salmon and the Stream Restoration Revolution because we it, there really is a, a philosophical revolution going on in terms of our understanding of, of what um, stream ecosystems do and watersheds in general and how we want them to behave. So um, with that said, um, and plus any any talk that has revolution in the in the title, you're going to be more interested in, right? So um, hopefully. Okay, let's see if we can go to the next slide. Oh, look at that, technical issues. Okay, all right, there we go. Um, so just as a, a sort of overview of where we find beaver, um, they are really primarily were or are located in um, the Northern Hemisphere uh, all throughout uh, North America. Um, the maps here on the right show where they um, uh, sort of historically and currently are located. They're a bit dated with uh, global warming and climate change. They're moving into the Arctic and there's a lot of uh, information in the news there. And then plus uh, sort of forensic or archeological evidence um, places them also about midway down the panhandle of Florida and then all over California and into the Great Basin. So, um, and into parts of, of uh, Mexico. So there, it's a little wider, but, um, and this map needs updating. Um, in, in Eurasia, they are all over, um, similarly, a, a similar sort of latitude. They were in the Middle East historically. In fact, there's a kind of um, uh, uh, petroglyphs or stone carvings um, with beaver in the uh, Tigris Euphrates, kind of the cradle of civilization from back then. So um, they've been all over. They've also been um, exterminated in a lot of it or extirpated in a lot of countries, particularly in um, in Europe, um, but there are reintroductions. So um, but they exist in Mongolia, the steppes of Mongolia historically, and there's been some reintroductions there, um, China, um, other places. So there's been a lot of extinction uh, or, or local extirpation more properly, and there are also ongoing efforts to restore them. Um, uh, there was um, likely hundreds of millions of beaver um, pre-settlement, and now we're in the in the tens of millions. But the the fact is is that we really don't know what the population was um, historically, and we don't know what it was um, uh, what it is now. We, uh, there just there aren't good census, so those are just kind of really back of the envelope calculation. Um, I think most people know that we. Um, have a uh, well about a 300 year history of beaver extirpation in the US. Uh, it started on the East Coast and it moved its way west. And there's a couple good books I cited there if you're interested in reading about sort of the history, but they were um, very valuable and they were considered a, a form of currency early on in our country's uh, history. Uh, and people, people traded in beaver pelts. Uh, and, and quite valuable. So it was, it was, um, it's been called the fur rush or the, the, the uh, golden fur rush, but there's been a strong economic motivation for clearing out beaver um, simply because of the value of their pelts. And then there was also motivation um, to clear them out because the lands that they were on were uh, um, prime areas for agriculture. And of course we were settling um, the European and, and uh, Eurasian settlement of the uh, of America was uh, predicated on essentially providing uh, finding places where farming could occur, and that was um, places where um, a lot of those were occupied by beaver. So, um, I I want to kind of you know a lot of what I do is just try to give a, a larger sort of uh, um, temporal and spatial context for some of these issues and. And um, one of the things we've looked at is the climate under which beaver evolved as a species. And that's sort of been a 30 million year, um, as far as we can tell, um, process. The age of mammals after the extinction of the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago, which is shown on the left of this um, uh, diagram. And what you see is, is a, um, what this, um, line is tracking is, is the estimates of the uh, change in temperature um, relative to the um, what we call the pre-industrial baseline. So what you see is, is that in the Eocene, sort of shortly after the, uh, the uh, asteroid the, or the meteor that took out the dinosaurs, um, we had a fairly warm climate relative to today. And then it slowly cooled over um, uh, tens of millions of years. 
and it was during this cooling that both beaver and, and salmon um, evolved and, and, and some of the forms started to, that we call the salmon and beaver, <clears throat> the species begin to evolve. And um, the climate cooled, cooled even further, but um, um, it moved along. And then um, sort of jumping to the last, you know, sort of tens of thousands, the age in which humans evolved, fairly stable climate um, and beaver, in that process, um, of course, took advantage of that climatic stability and, and conditions fairly favorable for them. Um, but they had evolved, as far as we know, um, uh, dam building activity, uh, dam building behavior, at least uh, three to five million years ago, and probably more like eight. And I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. But um, on the right of this, though, is showing you kind of where we're heading. So we've I think most people know are releasing a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere, and that is increasing um, uh, global temperatures. And the projections of what you see on the on the right are sort of various projections, with the uh, red line being the average scenario, but the uh, the range being shown there in in a sort of light colored brown or 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 mauve, I guess. Um, and what it shows is that we may be moving outside the evolutionary thermal window or the, or the thermal window in which um, beaver evolved and salmon. So we're kind of entering an area um, potentially in the next few hundred years that's, that's really going to be a climatic um, a, a temperature in particular, but a climatic condition and under which the mammals have not thrived under. Um, and that's important, um, not just for beaver, but for humans, because um, unlike birds and reptiles and things like that, we have a, a lower thermal tolerance. Um, and, and at a certain point, a certain temperature, um, we overheat. And, and as do beaver, as do all mammals, they just aren't designed to, to ha uh, handle um, temperatures that are um, at a level that actually much of Earth has existed. So um, it's, it's, um, just worth noting, it's not just important for beaver, but for us that we maintain our temperature regime in a uh, in a window that that's consistent with the conditions under which mammals, um, including us, evolve. So, um, so I wanted to give you a kind of evolutionary perspective on rivers, and and then and to give you a sense of where beaver fit into that. Um, and this is just a photograph or an image of a, a um, El, El Cobre uh, Canyon um, showing the stratigraphy of rivers and preserved in sediments. And it's been really interesting to, to look at the research that's come out of this because we get a sense of how rivers have evolved and behaved over time. So I kind of want to step through that. Um, and just to give you a sense of how long rivers have been around relative to you know, us and, and, and our, 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 our the rivers have been behaving naturally relative to um, um, us modifying rivers. Um, the sort of physical analogy is if you look at this, this um, hundreds of meters thick strata, um, and, it, and it's, it's several hundred million years old, and then you place a grain of sand on the top of the very tip top of this hole, um, uh, geologic formation, that is about the relative amount of time that we have been managing rivers and, 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 uh, and trying to um, twist them to our benefit. So um, I, I hope that gives you some sense of scale, but there's a really vast timelessness to rivers and, and the evolutionary processes that have been operating and we're just stepping into it in a really short time frame. Um, and up top is just kind of an overview. Um, you know, the existence of rivers have been about you know, three and a half to four billion years ago. On Mars, there's actually evidence of rivers on Mars at about 3.7 million years ago. There's rivers on Titan as well, rivers of methane. Um, they look very similar to what's there. We don't know how old they are, but rivers have been around a long time. Um, vegetation began modifying rivers about 440 million years ago. Um, beaver began modifying rivers about five um, to eight million years ago. And then human began modifying rivers at just a few thousands of years ago, 5,000 years ago. So we're fairly recent um, arrivals here. Um, 
So this is just kind of a, a hopefully quick and informative overview of sort of how rivers formed and, and in particular how life shaped rivers. And we don't really think of life as shaping rivers, but when you look back, you see that they, the rivers that we see today have really been shaped by the presence of life. Um, it, it, about 700 to 400 million years ago, cyanobacteria, mosses, and liverworts were, were, were the only things that were there. And the shape of rivers was the sheet braided plan form. Um, and I'm gonna walk through this, just some, some examples. Um, and uh, really unconsolidated blankets of sediment, kind of what you'd see from a glacial system. Um, about 400, mil 400 million years ago, terrestrial colonization by vascular plants occurred with shallow roots that changed the land form, then, uh, or the plan form, excuse me, of rivers, um, giving them a little more form to them, a little more um, uh, retention of sediment and, and some stable banks and such. And then about um, 400 million years ago, deeper complex roots formed and tufted above ground structures two to three meters high. Um, about um, uh, somewhere shortly after there, that we saw arborescence, that is the formation of trees with the canopies, forest, branch litter. And we started to see large wood and log jams. And, and again, changing pattern, anastomosing pattern, stable channels. Um, and then um, a mere five to eight million years ago to present, we saw beaver dams and canal building. And so a lot more increased pond habitat on floodplain, increased valley floor aggradation and step valley floor morphology on small streams and such. So um, just give you a quick pictorial of this. Obviously we, we don't have pictures of, of rivers that existed uh, 700 million years ago, but they were something like this, pretty, pretty non-structured. Um, um, and, and not no vegetation. Then as we started seeing some plants and some colonization, a little more, more structure to them, a little more defined channels and such. Um, and then interestingly, about this time um, of the uh, colonization of land by plants, of all these changes were going on in, in um, river forms, there was also a huge atmospheric um, CO2 drop um, and of course, plants use CO2, so um, it's it just coincident with that. But plants had a fundamental uh, effect on the shape of rivers and, of course, the atmosphere. And so they've been kind of managing our both our atmosphere and the um, shape of our rivers and the condition of them for, for hundreds of millions of years, um, which you want to think about the next time you go out and cut down a tree. But um, then over time, um, as, as plants develop deep and more complex roots, um, you started to get uh, even uh, more, more um, structure. And then another really important thing along the way that uh, a lot of people don't think about is that plants also through their root structure begin to um, dissolve um, minerals and form what's called min mineral clay. And that clay formed cohesion in soils. And so instead of just kind of piles of gravel and such, we started to see cohesion to soils and that allowed more structure. And so you're seeing vertical banks um, and more accretion and more retention in, and, and the formation of deltas when they hit the ocean because this, the materials could stick together. And then that, um, that clay also helped retain water. And of course that was beneficial to plants. So plants through the formation of clay were also creating conditions that were favorable to water retention, which also which allowed them to help um, grow and stay. So they were in the, over hundreds of millions of years, literally shaping earth um, and modifying it for their benefit. Um, then sort of really somewhat recent in terms of changes was, was this arborescence. And then you saw a lot of large wood um, and log jams showing up in the geologic record all of a sudden. Um, uh, you, you see um, channel meandering and, and, and avulsions more specifically. So you've got multiple channels and, and channel switching and, and just a whole lot more complex habitat forms as shown here in the sort of lower middle um, where you've just got a lot of channel movement, um, channels jumping their banks, forming new channels, cutoff channels, moving around, distributary channels, et cetera, um, driven by wood. Um, some examples here shown that, um, but um, tremendous amounts of wood. It's really hard to imagine how much wood was in the system. But um, so that's all the precursors um, 
leading up to the evolution of beaver and, and their dam building activity. Um, in, the, in there, by the way, was this Permian Triassic extinction that really wiped out most life on Earth. And just, it was a kind of nifty experiment. I mean, 250 million years later, it's a nifty experiment, um, bad at the time, but um, in retrospect, it really showed um, the effect of, of vegetation in particular on rivers, because when that happened, and, and uh, um, you know, there was a lot of volcanic activity, huge elevation of CO2 um, um, as a result of that uh, massive extinction, and rivers went back to the, what they looked like before really uh, um, land plants had, had, um, had evolved. So uh, it was, it's, it's quite interesting, but it helps demonstrate and, and show the, uh, the effect of um, plants on, on uh, these rivering ecosystems. Um, this is just kind of an overview, you can read it, but sort of how rivers behave in the absence of vegetation. I'm gonna skip over that in the interest of time um, and get to, to plants and rivers part five, um, which is beaver, the evolution of beavers. And, and we think of beavers as an animal that evolved to um, use vegetation to create an environment suitable to them. But if you're looking at it from a plant's perspective, they have really kind of trained beaver to use plant material to create environments that retain water on the landscape that make it more hospitable for plants. Um, so it's kind of a mutual, mutualistic relationship that's evolved. And um, um, you know, people talk about beaver as ecosystem engineers, but I really think of them as, as kind of ecosystem farmers because what they're doing is flooding an area and growing vegetation that is then suitable for them to eat and harvest. And, and of course the plants uh, um, grow too. Sort of similar to our relationship with corn really, is that they have a relationship with willow and sedges and such is, um, is it's a benefit to them and they create conditions ideal for their growth. Um, so that happened, as I said, relatively recently. And, um, and so that's been the latest big thing in terms of, of changes to rivers, and that's all limited to the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so, and it's been pretty interesting to see. And then in that, in that time, um, of course, uh, any species that's in a river have had to adapt, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, have had to adapt to beaver. And so, um, you know, they've had millions of years, or in the case of salmon, millions of generations to adapt and, and adjust to these um, structures that are in the system. And um, some of them, in particular, coho salmon, have really um, evolved to utilize them in a way um, that's that's very beneficial. And there, to the extent that that a lot of coho salmon um, survival, their ability to thrive and survive, is really dependent on the availability of, of beaver dams. Um, there's other species in other places that need them, but that's in, in, in here in the. Uh, the kind of west coast that's that's the big species that that really relies on beaver dam so there's been kind of a a, a, a co-evolution of, of uh, or co-dependency i guess and in, 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 in uh, habitat um between between uh, beaver and salmon um and i will again point to the uh, scott river watershed and betsy stapleton who showed just a wonderful uh, uh nighttime video of a beaver working on its dam as two coho salmon were just upstream resting in the pool and um, really kind of a nice little uh, summary of that relationship. So, um, and then um, then we arrive on the scene and I guess actually I, I, I wasn't entirely accurate when I said beaver were the last um, big change because we are the last big change to riverine ecosystems. And so we um, had hydraulic civilizations. We uh, appear fairly recently uh, you know, uh, and really spread planet wide, just a really, you know, sort of a hundred to a thousand years ago. And when we did a number of things, um, uh, building dams, drainage and irrigation canals, levees, hardened banks, channel straightening incision, a few images shown here. Um, here's some bank hardening images. So, so we've done things to rivers um, that have never occurred before. And um, there aren't the most species don't have the genetic makeup or the evolutionary history of dealing with something like these, and so they tend to be relatively lifeless 
um, simply because it's a novel environment to which few species are adapted. Um, you know, give 10 million years and keep you keep out for 10 million years, species will adapt um, uh, um, most assuredly. But right now that hasn't happened and evolutionary processes work slowly. So um, these are, are not what we would call a, a healthy functional um, ecosystem. Um, and then just to kind of put it in a sort of perspective of, of you know, us versus beaver in terms of experience and who we you know, might want to listen to or maybe why we want to listen to what beaver have done and how they've been managing streams um, is that they have a lot more experience than us and, and in terms of building them in a way that other species can, um, can utilize the, the habitat. So beaver, um, you know, we have about 5,000 years building dams. Um, beaver have about 5 million um, plus or minus. Canal building, similarly, um, we have about um, 5,000 years. They have about 5 million years. And then I just point out that the beaver seem to be able to navigate their canals better than um, some of us. This is that, that ship that was trapped in the Suez Canal. So just um, making a little fun of them there. Um, a stream restoration experience, beaver, of course, have been restoring streams or managing them for, again, about 5 million years or, or more, more likely, but that's as far back as we really have pretty concrete evidence, versus we've only been at it for about 100 years. So we're sort of newbies. We're kind of these goofy, naked apes, hairless apes that are, you know, we're, we're smart, but in terms of, of the experience to manage ecosystems in a way that are sustainable, we really don't have a very good track record of that. And so, you know, I look to beaver um, as, as much more experienced and, and really their, their sort of collective wisdom, and they, they probably learn through a lot through trial and error, but I look to them to see how they manage ecosystems because it's a useful template for, for us to follow and, and for us to kind of uh, use as a guide for how we might better manage our streams to benefit um, the, the other species on the planet and to and really ultimately um, us. So um, that's kind of the, the, the perspective I just wanted to share. Um, oh, and one more is this drainage experience. We're also really good at draining systems and beaver aren't very good at that. So we are good at one thing, better at one thing relative to beaver. And, and um, this shot to the left, oops, excuse me. The shot um, to the left is the is the um, Sacramento San Joaquin Valley and just a huge huge drainage network. Um, there's a, a shot below is just of a field with a huge amount of tiling, just to give you a sense of how intensive it is, um, and a diagram that sort of shows how it is. But we put in these these drainage systems and we we just drained a, a huge amount of the earth. Um, and um, even where we haven't drained it specifically like that, there's a, a tremendous amount of incision, which I'm going to talk to in a bit. Um, so, um, just to summarize this part of it, um, you know, through a variety of biophysical and biochemical mechanisms, terrestrial plants evolved river scapes to be highly retentive in terms of fine sediment water and organic material. And now they're being increasingly referred to as depot system. Um, so, you get a new word. Uh, here. Um, plants also greatly accelerated rates of fine sediment production, infiltration, and soil formation, what referred to as the clay mineral factory. Um, beaver dams, um, which are made of plants and muds, retain water, sediment, and organic matter at very high rates. Um, net effect is construction or accretion of well-watered, nutritionally rich, complex floodplain and valley floor habitat, ideal for plant growth. Um, that they've been operational for hundreds of millions of years and resilient to climate change and even extinction level events. So that's just kind of a little background. Um, um, if there are questions, um, we have there's 16 new messages. Let me just take a quick look. Michael, I don't think we have any questions. There was a little chit chat going on back and forth in the chat. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Great. Thanks. You can just, uh, I just wanted to give a little, little pause there. Um, okay. So um, to kind of continue on the human theme, we've significantly affected the ability of riverscapes to do all the things I just outlined to, to retain water, sediment, and organic material. And globally, um, 
we see that incision, drainage, and confinement has uh, significantly affected the hydrologic cycle. Um, and, and we've done this because we wanted to farm a lot of these lands and it's created productive farmland and that's helped our population grow, but it's also had some negative effects. And in the context of climate change, what it has done is uh, really exacerbated the effects of droughts because we've drained the landscape. Um, and it's not insignificant that the, the uh, table to the lower in the lower left um, it kind of gives you some sense of it. Um, you know, if there's a three three meter average water table lowering on arable lands, that's equivalent to about a third of our of the global freshwater discharge. Um, and arable lands are just um, twelve percent of the global land surface. There's other land use activities such as grazing, forestry, and urbanization that also cause incision. So that's kind of concerted estimate, but it gives you a sense of the scale at which our land use activities are affecting our ability of, of earth to store water on the landscape. Um, and um, um, it, it's fairly large and, and um, sort of un, not considered. We really haven't spent a lot of time looking at what the cumulative effects of that are. Um, by one estimate, some of this, uh, the amount of water that's no longer retained on the landscape is significant uh, enough to account for something like um, uh, six centimeters or so of the sea level rise that we're seeing around the world. So again, not, not an insignificant impact. This is um, just an image of an incision. Um, just that really just to show that um, this is from the Oregon Coast Range, but that we're able to see that a lot of the incision that's occurred has happened really recently, sort of in the 200 year old range. But um, um, it's just really um, just to give you a sense that, that um, we can actually document with fair bit of accuracy when incision has occurred, this down cutting that's occurred. And, and there's just a tremendous amount of it that has happened since really um, a, a massive population expansion occurred. And, and agriculture, and um, it's kind of coincident with that um, for, for the reasons I mentioned. Um, so in comes our friend Beaver again. Um, and we looked at, well, can we restore these incised streams? Um, we looked at sort of the natural rates at which this occurred because it happens naturally in, in geologic time due to changing uh, climate and such. Um, but it can take uh, on the order of centuries to millennium to go through this cycle of a a stable system on the upper um, on the top where there's either a, a single channel or multi-channel uh, um, uh, uh, river system or no channel at all. It's just a wetland. And then some perturbation occurs and, and you can cycle through and it starts down cutting, becomes a single channel, the water table starts lowering, and then it lowers further, you lose your riparian vegetation, um, and that's the incision phase. And then there's a widening phase where you get an inset floodplain, and that's sort of years to decade. And then you get this slow aggradational process, vegetation returning, sediments starting to get retained again along the lines of what I, I, I talked about earlier. And that can be decades to centuries um, or longer. And then you get back into this dynamic equilibrium, which can be um, centuries to millennia. So if we're trying to get back to this ideal state here with a raised water table and a really rich and complex system, um, it can take a very long time. And if we're trying to restore habitat for species that um, are endangered, such as a number of our salmon, coho salmon and, 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 and Siskiyou County and other species as well, um, we need to be doing something that doesn't take hundreds of years. Um, and so we looked at beaver and asked, well, can they be, can they, we noticed that they were doing a pretty good job in some cases restoring streams. And we looked at their aggradation rate um, we compared it to just vegetation. And what we found is, is that beaver can aggrade these inside streams fairly rapidly, uh, 10 to 15 centimeters a year, which in geologic terms is, is just astronomically fast. Um, that's, that's kind of on the range of a, of a meter every 10 years, which is, is uh, again, geologically, that's instantaneous. So we had these kind of clues that beaver could be used to restore these systems, um, and they could do it fairly quickly. Um, we put a paper out, um, a, a number of you are familiar with it, the uh, bioscience paper from 2015, sort of outlining how they do this naturally. Um, and they go through this process of, of damming these narrow incised streams. 
and then they blow out, the system widens, but then they come back and build again, they blow out and they go through the cycle of a grading and blowing out. Um, and, and over time, they build a system up. Um, and so it accelerates the process um, significantly, cutting it down when you have beaver. But we also observed that there were a number of places where beaver um, were in these systems in the trenches and shown in upper left in A, and they just kept getting blown out and it wasn't widening much and it was going slow. So, um, you know, when it was mentioned that I wrote the book on beaver restoration, um, this was sort of the, the, the what inspired that was um, seeing this phenomena and then asking, is there a way that we can help the beaver um, have stable dams and stay in these incised systems? And so, um, this was actually in Eastern Oregon out with a, 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 a colleague, a field assistant, uh, Ian Tatum, and we just kind of got this idea of, of putting in posts and pounding in posts into the beaver dams to reinforce them and, and see if that would help and started experimenting around and getting the permits to do that. And then um, from there we said, well, maybe we could do even better and actually start building sort of fake beaver dams or artificial beaver dams or what became known as beaver dam analogs and, um, and build them in places where there weren't beaver and see if we could mimic the effects and see if we could lure beaver in and get them to, to come into these systems and sort of accelerate the restoration process. So we did that um, and, um, and that's kind of started this whole BDA uh, um, beaver dam analog um, technique um, over the last couple of decades, um, which um, um, uh, again, the Scott River Watershed Council really pioneered that in, in California. They put the first ones in and, and, um, and then the technique's been evolving and such, and there's been a number of, of adherents. And, and so it's been really interesting to see that because the efforts and ways in which we um, uh, interact with beaver in a system or, or evolving and such. So, so it's pretty exciting. Um, just as a, um, by way of kind of explaining, um, I, I guess it's worth pointing out that um, when people learn a new restoration technique, they often go around everywhere saying, this is, this is what we should be doing everywhere. And I want to say, yeah, absolutely not. Um, this diagram here kind of shows the natural parameters. This is from the Snohomish River in Washington, but it shows the, the valley width on the y-axis and then bankful width or slope on the um, x-axis. It kind of shows where you tend to see beaver dams form relative to those parameters, which are pretty good predictors. The, um, the lines, that the average is the dot, and then the standard deviation is, is the, uh, are the lines. And so you can kind of get a sense in terms of where they, what they, you know, they like relatively small streams, generally less than eight meters bankful width. Um, they like a, a, a valley width in, in a fairly wide range, but something in the order of at least 30 meters and then upwards. If they get too wide, obviously it's hard to build a dam across them and stuff, but, but you know, I'd say sort of 100 to 300 meters is a pretty good um, width for an ideal beaver um, uh, um, dam system, and then, uh, you know, not too large a stream. Um, they definitely can dam very small streams, but they do, it does get to be a point of really a, and around uh, 10 meters or 30 feet, um, that's during flood stage, or just um, that um, they really don't build a lot of dams out there, and they just blow out too much. And then slope, uh, I think most people know, relatively low slopes, um, really kind of the average being 1%. The generally lower slopes are preferred. And above 4%, you do see some, but you don't tend to see a lot above that. And the ponds that are formed tend to be fairly restricted in, in terms of the uh, amount of, of flooding. So, um, but just to give you a sense of where, where it's worthwhile, um, this is just in the same basin, just to show kind of a little bit of a clunky graphic, but that there's a large overlap between beaver well, and salmon and people habitat. So if you're doing, if you're working with beaver, doing beaver restoration, what you quickly run into is the fact that people tend to like the same types of habitat that beaver like, which are small, low gradient valley floors. And you see a lot of farming and, and especially uh, 
small scale rural farming in these, um, not just in the US, but elsewhere. Um, and so agriculture uh, is, is in many cases, a, a overlap of um, with, with prime beaver habitat. Um, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but it's 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 up there. Um, let's move on. Um, so I I threw this in there. I was thinking about Gareth because he likes to quote his people from history, and so I, I I wanted to at least quote somebody from history. And the concept of failure, which is really important in the context for beaver and for people that are trying to use beaver to restore, us, is that beaver dams fail and they should fail, and that's part of the natural process. So where beaver dams are not designed by beaver and they shouldn't be designed by humans to be permanent structures and that we, we really want to fail. And um, anyway, I have a little fun here, but just you know, quoting Samuel Beckett um, uh, as the, the philosopher king of, of beaver and beaver restoration. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, and I just left it, you know, sort of with the sense that uh, I, I'm not gonna go through all these, but you, you can read them, but um, that, you want them to fail, and, and so uh, you know one way to think about it is that, that if these aren't failing, that, that that if the dams aren't failing, then the project itself is kind of a failure because it means you've you've overbuilt it and it's and it's too strong. So, so um, it's not behaving like a beaver dam. Um, and here's some examples of beaver dam analogs. This is from actually from Garrett's property, um, uh, just at different flows, just to show this is a fairly massive one. We were able to. Um, um, get, use it to get some water into uh, a, a side channel in the uh, Scott River and, and create some slow water habitat along the way and had a number of objectives, but including protection of um, some farmland and, and, uh, um, uh, and, and then but also creating a lot of good habitat along the way. So, but um, anyway, fairly robust structures can be built, um, but they do fail. Um, this one is uh, another example in Triple Creek, sort of used. This is in size screen. This is in Washington. Um, and a number of BDAs were put in, and this just kind of shows the, the sequence of events and the, the rapid aggregation. So we got this screen that there was historical evidence of it being um, a beaver complex, but then the, you know, we don't know what happened, but the beaver disappeared. The stream cut down several meters. And, um, and it was kind of locked in. And so these structures got put in and in a fairly short order, um, enough sediment was retained to bump the system back up and to reconnect the floodplain and, and stuff. So and that's Robed Parish, if anybody knows him. Um, he just uh, left Washington for Alaska. So, um, but pretty impressive. Um, this is a project in Bridge Creek, Oregon. This is where BDAs originated for, uh, 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 myself and Ian and, and then later others kind of implemented this and, and a fairly robust restoration, but we, we installed them in four different treatment reaches. And what this really just shows uh, on the upper left is just once we got these in and the beaver, it took a little bit of time for them to respond. But what happened is, is all these structures and we put hundreds of them in and beaver started using them and the population started expanding. And then the number of dams outside of the treatment reaches and within the treatment reaches just exploded. Um, we had a long-term history of the number of dams from, from the 90s, actually late 80s. And they, they kind of came up and went down and um, whether if it was a low flow year, you'd see more dams, but they all got blown out pretty regularly, which is what this lower right figure shows that most dams were lost in a year. And so by putting in the BDAs, we lengthened the lifespan and the number, and we kind of got the system to where it was stable enough that flows were being dispersed enough that it's sort of self-operational now, um, where it was when I last looked at it, and, um, and the, the populations were able to maintain themselves and, and such. So um, I would I would be remiss not to mention that that there are other types of restoration that, that achieve the same goals and um, and sometimes faster. They're, they're kind of more expensive, but there's this process called um, trench filling where um, where there's incision trenches and and uh, simply get in the bulldozers and scrape off some of the adjacent floodplain or lands or piles of you know road or the levees and stuff. I, I hopefully or or, or in general possible artificial structures and put them into the trench and that just raises the water table. 
this is an example from Eastern Oregon, and um, it's from Paul Powers, someone who's been doing a lot of that. And that's based on um, uh, uh, Brian Kluwer and Colin Storm's stream evolution model, uh, sort of similar to what I showed you with the BB. Um, but this is another technique. Um, and then um, I, just to, uh, sort of the other thing that's starting to emerge is really thinking about um, uh, in terms of process restoration, underground um, restoration, and thinking about how we can manage the underground flow, especially when it's been disturbed. Um, the, um, and these are just examples from around the world. It's, it's, it's more common to be putting in structures that push flow to the surface um, in, in uh, third world countries, and not so much, and in Japan, and, and actually in Europe in some cases. Um, here in, the, in, the, in North America, this isn't really a consideration of, of really restoring um, underground processes and, and sort of the permeability, changing the permeability of these systems. Um, but I, uh, in the lower um, middle and lower right, though, I'm you know, showing uh, this from Siskiyou County, the Scott uh, River mine tailings. And um, it's really an important consideration because in places like this, what's happened is because the underground component of these stream systems have been so degraded and disrupted that the water no longer flows on the surface during um, the critical parts of the year and it tends to flow underground. Um, so there's water in these systems, but it's just not on the surface. It's not expressed on the surface. So um, we're looking at ways, and again, the Scott River Watershed Council, um, I think this is a leader in this, is how we can restore these areas and how we can get the underground flow of water to be expressed on the surface such that it's beneficial to um, fish, you know, salmon in particular, but fish and wildlife. And, and just in general, as I think, I, I hope it goes without saying, but I will say it is that um, the ecological benefits to water are much greater when it is on the surface rather than underwater or underground, excuse me. So um, I hope that's obvious. Um, and then another thing that is going on in terms of the goals of restoration and stream restoration and, and the role for beaver is that um, because of climate change, we're starting to look at, at carbon storage as a restoration goal in and of itself. So outside of say fish and wildlife habitat, which is, has historically been sort of the, the reason for restoration, um, we're looking at, at how these systems store carbon and, and what role they play. And the evidence coming out is, is that historically they were, um, um, very important or, or, or stored an awful lot of carbon uh, in the soil through the burial of wood and that beaver dams um, were very important in terms of their ability to uh, uh, not just retain water and sediment but to retain organic carbon and keep it um, 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 stored and, and not uh, in, in part of the uh, uh, atmospheric carbon um, pool. So um, just kind of giving some sort of food for thought here, but in terms of restoration science, um, sort of the most debated question is, do we design for form or, we do, or do we manage process? And, and if you're working with Beaver, you, you quickly understand that you can't design a form and you're working with a living organism that is going to have its own opinion about what to do and it's going to, it's, it's a dynamic process because it is an organism that is, is, is operating in the landscape. And so you can't design a form, but historically that is kind of how we have viewed river restoration is to design a, a sinuous channel to control the river, to create a form, um, kind of like how you would go to a hospital to have a leg fixed and then, and then uh, set in a cast and then you walk away and it's, it's there, it's, it's fixed. Um, and that's very different from the evolving, and this is sort of the revolution that's occurring, which is that instead of designing forms, um, we really need to think about more of a stewardship component to river restoration and management, and that we really have to think about managing them and managing the natural processes that occur. So um, I just give this as an example. This would be maybe a form, and, and this is what's going on, and, and we're spending a lot of money to hire people to engineer a natural-looking river form that looks maybe something like this, pretty, you know, this looks pretty good, right? And it's not straight, it's got a lot of bends in it, looks like good habitat. But the reality is that over time, what we see 
is that the river moves, it adopts many, many different positions on the landscape in many, many different forms. And so if we if we design a river with the expectation that it's going to be in one place, however sort of aesthetically pleasing or functional looking it is going to be, it's not really a functional river. Um, and it's not something that a lot of species are, are adapted to. They're not adapted to static rivers. Um, um, and then uh, just a little plug here that we, we tried to um, sort of boil this down, this concept down. This was uh, Damien Ciotti, Matt Condolf, Karen Pope, uh, Jared McKee, and myself wrote a paper that was just recently published in Bioscience to compare this idea of form-based restoration versus process-based restoration and sort of the benefits of it. And we, we boiled it down into really consideration of, of, of space time, energy, and materials, and to look at these um, four elements and, and how you view them in terms of your restoration design really determines um, sort of the functionality of the system. Uh, I won't get into all of this, except just simply if you're, if you're interested in this to go, uh, it, it's available online for, for free, I believe, at public access. Um, it's a bioscience paper by uh, Damien Ciotti, to give the reference. Um, but um, it was, as I say, really sort of a, a, a to get a general philosophical framework for um, how to use um, not just beaver in, in, the, in, in terms of restoration, but how to think about um, restoration in general and really to think of it more as, as managing processes and how you might manage them and how you might develop criteria for determining if you're managing processes versus building a form. And uh, again, what the sort of benefits of each one are. Um, so um, I'm going to skip over this, but oh, well, just to point, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief here. I realize we've been at this for an hour, more than an hour, but sort of the historical view of restoration really was thinking about this balance between incision and aggradation, and that that a, a, a healthy stream was one where there was a balance between those two, that it was static, essentially, uh, in terms of its vertical component. Um, I'm simplifying here. But what we find is, is that really that's not how a natural stream functions. What a natural stream functions and what the life within it does is it tries to retain materials. It tries to, because those are needed to grow and to thrive. So there's kind of this positive feedback and beaver dams being sort of the prime one, but wood jams as well. And then the roots of vegetation and some of the stuff I talked about earlier in terms of evolution, that all of these are really geared towards creating a non-equilibrium system. So it's, it's one that is tipped uh, in, the, in this, in this um, scale. The, the, the pointer there is tipped towards aggradation. And that's kind of the natural condition of a stream, a healthy stream that's full of life, is that it's, a, it's really one that is trying to retain sediment. And, and you, know, you look at any valley, and that's essentially what's gone on over time, right? The, the, the farmland that's on a valley floor is there because the system has aggraded materials over time. It didn't just move sediment through the system. It trapped it, deposited it on the valley floor, and vegetation played a big role in that. Um, beaver, um, in, in, well, in the Scott Valley, for example, beaver were tremendous. It was, I think many of you know, it was historically named uh, um, Beaver Valley because of the number of beavers. So you know, in certain conditions and places, beaver played a very important role in retaining this information, uh, uh, these, these uh, elements um, that, then of course, uh, um, we have exploited for, for ourselves and to, um, to grow food for us and to expand our populations. Um, uh, just so, uh, sort of, again, just kind of wrapping up that there are other types of dams, natural dams operating at different time scales. They're not just beaver dams. And if we think about the dams in a general sense as obstructing the flow of sediment and, um, um, and, and water, then these are just some other examples, um, including if you think about it more broad, broadly, tectonic sea level rise. The key element or the thing that united all of these is that they are increasing flow resistance, they lower the slope, and they reduce stream power um, per unit width or unit stream power such that um, sediment can settle out in particular. Here's just an example of a, of a giant landslide complex in Washington. 
um, which is considered a problem. But I looked at this and I said, well, yeah, I mean, it's knocking out a highway and stuff because it keeps sliding and interrupting transportation. But what people that consider it a hazard fail to realize, here's the landslide, the Nile Valley landslide. You can read about it and if you Google it. Um, upstream here is Nile Valley, you know, which is what it's named for. And the reason Nile Valley exists and it's not Nile Gorge is because this landslide keeps blocking the river and slowing the transportation of sediment. And so it's accumulated upstream for miles and miles creating this valley. So that's the, the scale at which it's operated. It's created, well, again, productive farmland that we benefit from. So, so this sort of obstructionism that occurs um, through geologic or, or biological um, actions are, are really quite beneficial over the long term. Um, I think this is my last slide. I just um, want to kind of make this plug for the idea that, that we really are at a point in our, our evolutionary history where um, we've, we've really degraded a lot of our natural environment and we, we need, and we've done it at a ma massive, massive scale. Um, but we're also realizing that and we're trying to restore things. And, and there are other countries that have recognized the magnitude, I think to a larger extent than we have or, or are doing something about it. And, and so we've created these large scale problems they are going to require large scale solutions. And so um, I give some, two examples here. One is the Lewis Plateau in, in China, um, where they have this arid landscape, they over farmed it and lots of er erosion, excuse me, lots of problems. Oh, well, they sent out massive, and this is an area about the size of Belgium, by the way. They sent out masses of people and really with hand tools and just a, a kind of massive volunteer, or not volunteer, but um, uh, army uh, of people, they terraced these areas and they planted vegetation. And um, you can see the visual difference um, um, in, in the photos from the left and the right, um, sort of before and after, uh, after about a uh, 15 year period. Um, pretty impressive. Um, they, there's reports that it's changed the weather, that there's more precipitation. And so they've gone from an arid system that holds little vegetation to kind of a moister, um, more um, beneficial climate. So inspiring. There's a group um, called the Weather Makers. The, um, the, um, you can see the website there, Green the, the Sinai. They believe that if they can get enough vegetation there, that that will cause enough evapotranspiration that that will increase the amount of, of moisture in the air and the way the winds are moved that that moisture laden air would then stack up against mountains, rise up the mountains till it becomes, till it condenses as rain, that rain will go down the mountains and then flow into this area. And so they're creating a self-sustaining ecosystem um, and, and taking the desert and, and, and making it um, uh, green again. So, um, you know, so I, I say that because when we're talking about beaver restoration, it, really to be meaningful, it's going to be, you really want to consider at the watershed scale and, and restoration in general, really to think about it at this scale. It's to be successful as a species in the long term, we're going to have to think about restoration at this scale. Um, there's a lot of regulatory obstacles in the U.S., um, what we call green take. Um, so we do need to, that, that, that has inhibited, in my view, um, from us proceeding with some of these large scale projects. Um, and um, there are many people that will speak that can speak to that. But I just note that other countries, um, including you know, poor countries like Ethiopia, Jordan, Egypt, and China, they are engaging in these massive restoration projects. And the U.S. is really falling apart, um, falling not just apart, but behind a bit in, in this. So I think that's that's really it. Here's some summary. Um, I won't read them. You can read these. Um, but well, uh, you know, just wrap it up, I guess. That, that the key, key thing is, is again, I've emphasized this, is that the, 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 the way we're trending towards thinking about um, restoration is to create ecosystems that acquire and retain resources. And the key resources are fine green sediment, water, organic material, and nutrients. Um, and that really the restoration um, state of the art, um, again, is practiced by uh, notably in Siskiyou County by the Scott River Watershed Council is to create ecosystems with strong biological controls to create retentive ecosystems or otherwise known as aggradational environments or now uh, depot systems. 
Um, so uh, and then I invite uh, you know, uh, on the lower right, um, historically we have thought of streams as drainage networks and I just invite you all to maybe think about them more as um, habitat networks rather than drainage networks. And that's more in line with what they have existing function as um, over literally uh, uh, millions of years over the, over the, the millennia and over the, the um, time frame that all of us uh, as a species or most mammals has, have existed um, on this earth. So, so something to think about. Um, and there's the last shot, courtesy of Ellen Wool, a uh, really fantastic research scientist in Colorado, um, um, showing a very retentive ecosystem um, and that's courtesy of our friend the beaver. So with that, I think we'll call it um, opening up the questions. All right, sounds good, Michael. We do have a couple of questions for you. One of them from earlier on this evening from Francis Mangles. What do you see as the effect of cattle grazing on beaver? Seems everywhere they had cow grazing on public lands, the beaver were gone in about 10 or 20 years. Not to mention the Forest Service guys trapped many of them at the same time frame. Yeah, um, oh, it's a good question. I mean, it's hard to to answer that um, because it really, uh, a, 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 in a sort of um, definitive way, because it really depends on the amount of cattle that you have and how you manage them. Um, I cer certainly cattle can coexist, um, but but the um, and and there's. Um, ranchers that are encouraging beaver to come onto their um, lands because, um, notably in some places in Idaho, because what they do is just they raise the water table and they set what they call sub irrigate. So it, if you have a flat valley, you have a beaver dam, it retains water on the landscape, it creates a greener, lusher system. So they lose some of their their land to the beaver pond and the, and the sort of riparian or the mucky area. Uh, around a beaver dam complex, but they benefit because the land outside of that is, is much more productive. So um, you can absolutely have cattle and beaver uh, coexist in a compatible way. Um, I think historically people haven't really looked at that. They've looked at beaver as competitors and they've let cattle um, come in and, and eat all of the vegetation that the beaver need. And so you get this incision cycle, you get the lowering of the water table, and then the land is no longer um, good for cattle or beaver. Um, and that's been sort of the, the history. Um, the, the, uh, I showed you in Bridge Creek in Oregon, in fact, those, those are BLM lands, but the reason they're BLM lands is because ranchers um, abandoned them because that's exactly what happened. They, they um, overgrazed the land and the stream in size, the water table lowered, it was good and longer to really get the water they needed to um, sufficient to run cattle. And so the um, BLM with the public bought the ranches out and then now we've restored it and gotten the beaver back and, and stuff. So, so um, it really just depends on how you manage the cattle. Um, and, but I would agree historically, most of the time, beaver and cattle have not, the, the cattle have not been managed in such a way that, that beaver can also thrive. Um, but that's changing over time. All right, thank you. From Facebook, Pamela asks, what other restoration benefits do you see from non-dam denning beaver colonies? From non, well, a lot of times, I just said a lot of, yeah, they're called bank beaver, a lot of, cases where we observed is bank beaver are just beaver that haven't yet built a dam. So we've seen the beaver den um, not, and not build dams and then something triggers, I don't know, where they, they get old enough or something and then all of a sudden dams start popping up. And in fact, we've induced that behavior with the construction of BDAs. Um, but having said that, the, the question was really if they don't build dams, are there still benefits? I would say absolutely because um, they're, modifying the riparian area they they will often build canals they will build um they will add complexity in the form of, of um, bringing wood into the stream in terms of their caches in terms of the burrows themselves they'll build those sort of bank um, dams and such and um we've seen 
there, there are canals and such that go into main stem rivers. If you go in there, those provide little uh, kind of pullouts for fish. Um, uh, in the uh, Salmon River in Idaho, we've seen uh, uh, numerous Chinook salmon using that habitat. So they're adding complexity to the system, um, even if they're not building dams. And, um, um, and so there, there's some, but that hasn't been as well studied um, for obvious reasons because the impacts are less. But, um, yeah. All right, moving on to the next question. This one from Brenton Kelly, who asks, how can we streamline beaver relocation in California? Oh, there's a there's a short answer with a a long question. Um, for those that aren't familiar, um, moving beaver is generally not allowed in California, um, and you need special permits and such. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife can actually move them, but they are hesitant to do so. And then federal um, employees or agencies can move beaver, but they can only move beaver to federal land. And then um, uh, there's a little bit of debate, but um, tribal lands as well. So there's kind of some workarounds against the, the philosophy. Um, historically, though, uh, California um, did relocate and introduce beaver to areas where they've been, the, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, or formerly Fish and Game, did relocate beaver. Um, so, um, I, I was really working with CDFW to get them to use the tools that they have, which is there, again, they can move beaver, um, to uh, understand the benefits. Um, I've spoken with them. Um, there's been, unfortunately, a vein of, of beaver being um, non-native that I think we've done enough research to convince most people that's not the case, including finding beaver dams, uh, carbon dating them in, in the Sierra Nevada and elsewhere along the coast and, and such, um, finding evidence of beaver. So there, there's kind of been this history of, of them not belonging that's, that's disappearing. Um, uh, slowly, but but really, it's it's focusing on the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and educating them and creating public support for for it because the tools exist right now. They just uh, CDFW is just hesitant to employ them. Um, I will say too that there's a number of groups out there that are working on moving beaver and Lagunitas Creek, for example. They're trying to bring in beaver and they're working with CDFW and they're and they're tackling this problem. Whoever asked the question, if you want to contact me, I can put you in touch with some of the people in California that are working on that. But there's a, definitely a movement afoot to, to do that. All right. Thanks, Michael. There is, so from David Simmon, he asks, how do you start a beaver restoration project? Um, yeah, you, <laughs> I would say talk to Betsy and Sharda. <laughs> I mean, it, it sort of depends on where you are. Uh, I, I don't know if they're laughing or, or not, but I hope, hopefully you guys are. <laughs> um, that, that I think, you know, it depends. I mean, it depends what land you're on, right? Who owns the land? Um, and, and that's kind of the key thing is to have somebody that supports it. Um, and then um, it's a question, uh, again, of, of, you know, getting the funding for it, if, depending on what you want to do, getting, um, you know, there's the beaver restoration guidebook and can give you kind of a sense of what you can do. There's a whole section in there, in fact, on beaver on, in terms of how to how to catch and retain beaver and then redistribute them into the landscape. So there's a lot of good information getting up to speed. Um, there's a lot of people in California that are doing it. So reaching out and talking to some of the practitioners that are that are doing it is, I think, a, a great way to go. Um, uh, on that. And again, I, I can provide some information, but um, getting knowledgeable and reaching out to people that are, that are already in, in practicing and doing it, and, and in particular are familiar with the permitting um, challenges. That's, that's one of the biggest obstacles is, is the, um, the permitting, whether, whether it's BDAs or, or other types of beaver mimicry or, or relocating beaver, um, the permitting is your biggest obstacle. All right, and for for the folks who had asked that question, Kim did just put the link 
to the Scott River Watershed Council's website in the chat box if you want to follow up there. And um, there's just one last question that I wanted to bring up with you, Michael, it was a topic at SWIFT. And I think a question that's um, probably pretty common, and that is the question about can fish get over beaver dams? Ah, well, there's first the question of do they want to get over beaver dams, which we discussed. <laughs> but um, it is a perennial question. And, um, you know, we try to address that as objectively as we can, and we've done a number of studies. Uh, in the Scott River watershed because it comes up uh, um, repeatedly. And so, you know, obviously we can't test every fish, but we, we tested the young of salmon, of particular coho salmon and steelhead trout um, um, and, and looked and did a bunch of tagging. And we looked, you know, at, at, and it was kind of a fun little project because we put these little antennas all over that protect the fish. And, the short of it was is that we we ran an experiment. In fact, it's it's been accepted for publication, um, uh, and we found that that for the most part, um, the beaver were able to get either over the um, dams or go around them, go swim around them. Um, so that was pretty encouraging. But that's a specific dam, specific set of conditions. Um, and then subsequent to that. Um, uh, a graduate student, um, Chris uh, O'Keefe, did, did a graduate work and asked that same question, but looked at smaller fish, did some hatchery experiments. Um, David White at NOAA has done some work using hatchery coho and sort of more in a, in a, in a uh, 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 experimental setting uh, 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 and such. And then in general, what they found is, is that the fish are able to get up and over them. Um, um, and then the last, um, the, the, these are juvenile, juvenile salmons were able to get up and over them. And um, so fairly, I, I think what we see is that yes, they can. At the same time, what we um, saw, just a little side experiment in the Scott River system, is that fish were tagged that were below a series of beaver dams, or BDAs actually, kind of modified by beaver. Um, and they were below, and then we, we tagged them. And, well, they're there, they seem happy. Um, well, they can they get up and over? And, and what we saw was that um, no, they didn't ever get up and over, but they never even tried. They didn't want to. So that was kind of gets to this, well, do they want to get over the, the beaver dam? In that case, the fish that we tagged, they, um, you know, we lost track of them over time, um, but there was never any evidence that they even moved up and got close to the dams in an effort to get up and over them and failed or, or succeeded. So, so um, kind of a hard, hard question to answer definitively for every fish, but the, the growing evidence is that um, if fish are so motivated, um, they are able to get up and over these. Um, and of course, adult fish, that hasn't really been a concern by and large, but I think that there are circumstances, especially with drought, where you do want to be mindful that um, because there's, there's water withdrawals and then now there's this climate change uh, um, related drought that, that I think that even though it hasn't been well documented, I think that there are instances where, where adult fish are returning and they are blocked by beaver dams. And so, you know, in, in some cases, um, there have been people who have just simply notched the dams. You kind of monitor them and notch the dams and make sure that the adults can get up and move it, especially for, for uh, um, species of critical concern. But, but even, even in cases where that's occurred, um, we've also seen that the fish um, spawn below the dams and spawn successfully below the dams. And so it's, it's sort of hard to know how critical it is to do that. But because of concerns of populations, that's what's happened. And, um, um, you know, it's sort of this assumption that that we want to make sure they can get up and over, um, even if it may or may not be a benefit to them. All right. Well, we did have one more question come in, and I'm going to make this the last question of the evening from Edward Groski asking, would the West Coast states accept East Coast states overpopulations of beaver relocations? Um. <laughs> Probably not. I, I think just because of the um, 
potential. I mean, there's a, just sort of the distance and stuff, and I, I don't know if the question's tongue in cheek, but but I think just the logistics of moving them would be prohibitive. But there's also genetic um, considerations and such like that. So you, it would be a massive gene flow. That, I mean, right right now, California is is hesitant to move beaver from one watershed to another. So I just I, I just can't see anybody being comfortable with that, and it just it, it seems. Uh, very unlikely in, in my lifetime for that to occur. I, I, I think there's plenty of beaver in the West and, um, that are being removed, lethally removed um, in California, Oregon, Washington, elsewhere, that um, there's a lot of local sources for beaver. Um, and then if you have good habitat for beaver, a lot of times they show up anyway. There, there's more of them out there than you think. Um, and there's a lot of them. So if you're interested in beaver um, uh, or using them as restoration, really kind of understanding what the habitat needs are, what conditions um, create an environment for them to thrive, um, that's, that's sort of the first step. And then getting the beaver to show up is, is the next. All right. Well, Michael, thank you. I appreciate you taking the questions and appreciate you spending your time with us this evening and getting into some more detail on a subject that, you know, some of the folks with us tonight have heard about in the past. So I want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you again with our next uh, slideshow in March and then our, fi our final webinar in April on the 20th. Hope you all enjoy your evening. Remember that this is being recorded. You can go back and revisit it in the next couple of days once we get the video posted. And everyone have a lovely evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Michael, thank you. Have a good night. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone.